Australian Wealth Builders, helping time poor executives build financial independence through property investing. Ken McClellan here. Welcome to today's podcast powered by Open Corp. I've got with me today Michael Bozza Beresford. How are you, Boz? G'day, Ken. Going well. Michael's a business partner of mine and one of the directors, the director of investment services at Open Corp. We've also got Matt Lewison. Matt, how are you? Yeah, good. Thanks, Ken. How are you doing, guys? Very, very well. Matt's one of the, also one of the directors of Open Corp and he heads up our analytics team. So he's aptly named the uh, propeller head of the team. Well done, Matt. You've, you've dubbed that name now. I've, I've called you that last week, I think it was. So I'm just going to keep drilling it home until it sticks. I don't know if it will catch on, mate, but you can keep trying. <laughs> so thanks for joining us, guys. We're obviously in different locations today in lockdown. So I appreciate you coming together. I wanted to pose today being in lockdown, there's so many people I speak to as I'm wandering the streets when you bump into neighbours that um, some are having really good economic times, some are having really tough times. And I'm finding that some is due to job loss. And to be honest, in this area, very little is due to job loss, but I'm finding a lot is to do with spending. So I wanted to talk today about some of the hacks people can think about when they're at home. I want to talk a bit about property and the CoreLogic RP data has landed today. So I want to go through some of the market movements, some are very surprising in some areas. And I know you've got some insight, Matt, because you look after the acquisition side. But Michael, you recently done a webinar with Mitch Creek out to his database. And one of the topics was actually what we're talking about today. Is that right, Bob? Yeah, exactly right. So obviously, you know, the, the webinar I did with Mitch was around you know, his limitless mindset. He obviously applied it from a sporting background. Mitch is obviously an NBL player. He's probably the number one NBL player in Australia, close to the Phoenix. Yep, yeah, he's been in the NBA and, and an all-round good guy, you know, client of mine. So what we've been able to teach Mitch over the journey, he wanted to try and impart some of the basics around cash flow management for people. So really what I talked through were three things. Number one, kind of the process for managing money, what's effective, what's different to how we're taught to think about it. Like most things to do with investing, it's really just around the mindset. Then I went through some hidden traps. So these are probably the the little gems that we can leave people with today on where money can just be frittered away, where savings can be made and where people can get ahead. And so I guess really, if we bring it back to basics, I remember a book I read over 10 years ago. It's called The Richest Man in Babylon. It was written in the the mid-1920s. My dad gave me that book to read when I was about 14 years old and made me read it. it uh, yeah, I read that book. Very well. It's a classic and, yeah, it's clearly stood the test of time because it's nearly 100 years old. But some of the clarity that I got around very simple money management tips and budgeting were, uh, you know, still stuck with me today and things I still apply today. So, you know, it's important to understand kind of, you know, for our listeners – if you don't feel that you're good at managing money, definitely don't give up and don't use that as a reason not to start because how we're brought up to think about money is that we don't discuss it. You know, you never tell people what you used to earn or whether you had a mortgage or all that kind of thing. And as a result, financial education wasn't something that we kind of got brought up with. Just like goal setting and investing, you can't expect to be an expert by this afternoon. It takes some time and it's a refining process. But the key takeaway out of the book for me was to save 10% of what you earn. Now, the mistake that a lot of people make is that they they look at the paycheck that comes in every week, fortnight or month, they'll go and live life, and then they'll hope at the end that there's 10% left that they can stick into savings. Yeah, very true. What Richest Man in Babylon was talking about is the day that it comes in, 10%, that savings amount is the first part that goes into savings, and then you live off the rest. A conversation we had years ago kind of is the natural extension of that. And, you know, think about the last pay rise that you got for those of you listening out there. Did that pay rise in full go towards savings and getting you further ahead? Or did your lifestyle just improve by that amount and your living expenditure went up? So, yeah, that was a really key lesson. Anyone that hasn't read the book, I definitely recommend picking up a copy of The Richest Man in Babylon. Yeah, I remember it's very true about uh, what you said about the Australian way of life is not have to have anything to do with savings, really. And we're told to have a piggy bank, and that's about the extent of our budgeting and saving strategies passed down from our parents. I remember my mid to late 20s going from working at Telstra on a very low wage. I think I built my wage up to about just under 50 grand a year, and I went to the recruitment industry, and my base salary was 100 grand. So I doubled my wage. 
I didn't save any more. I moved down to Elwood, lived by the beach with six guys in a house and had one of the best years of my life, but but I didn't save a cent extra. So it's very funny how, you know, we can go huge pay rises and the money doesn't stay in the bank. I always thought of myself as a terrible saver, pretty much from the age of 19, 20. I, for some reason, just felt like I could never save money. I was able to save until I was 18 and a half, bought my first property with Al. And after that, I was just like, I never had any spare money. And it wasn't until years later, I was living in Brisbane with three other mates and we were living a pretty frugal life, like having two minute noodles for dinner most nights of the week. We found some nice $9 barbecue chickens at the local <laughs> petrol station. It was a great coming home from training uh, meal. But um, I realized that a few years after that, I was like, actually, I was able to continue to buy property through the whole time of not being a good saver. And the reason I always thought I wasn't a good saver is as soon as I got paid, I was paying interest, I was paying rates, I was paying maintenance bills or whatever it was, I was putting my money into the properties and they were going up in value. But because my own personal bank account wasn't going up all the time, I felt like I wasn't saving money. But as soon as I could afford to, I'd buy my next property and kind of just always prioritize that and eventually started to pay off because after a while, obviously, you catch up, the income's grown from the properties, personal income's gone up, and all of a sudden, you get to a point where you go, I actually can't, I can't spend money as fast as I'm making it anymore. And it kind of just dawns on you all of a sudden, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm sure there's lots of people out there who, perhaps like me, can't watch their bank account going up without doing something with it. It's just what they do with the money when they get it is probably different. Yeah, I think there's a negative positive as well. If you understand negative debt or bad debt, I understood at a very young age, I understood that to make sure if I was buying a car, I wouldn't get debt on it, I'd save up to get it. So I would save for a specific thing and then I'd spend everything else once I got that item. I remember so that year living in Elwood with the boys and then moving from there out to Bayswater. When I first bought my first house, I had to, and this comes down to sacrifice, I remember I think it was Joe Hockey a year or so ago got smashed because he said Australians are terrible at savings and young people just go out and have avocado on toast, smashed avo breakfasts. And I was sitting there going, I remember my wife saying, oh, you can't say that. And I said, I hate to say it, but I actually agree with him. I never went to a cafe until I was 25. You know, and there was no such thing as a cafe. You'd go and get a burger from a burger shop or a fish and chip shop. But I went from living by the Bayside to out in Bayswater, and I guarantee there's no water in Bayswater, but I moved out there because uh, that was my first purchase. But the only way I could purchase that property was to sell my car. So I was working in Burwood at the Telstra call centre at the time. And so what I did was ride my bike from Bayswater to the call centre and back again. And then once I got my finally got my recruitment job, I had to go and get a, an actual loan because it had to work people to drive around. But I bought my house by that stage. Yeah. So not making the mistakes, which I saw my brothers make by getting bad debt and credit cards, allowed me to get that first house. But once again, I was working two or three jobs at that point in time trying to get money together when I finally realised I wanted to save for something. And I think having yeah. the goal of saving for something, and this is where I think people are getting in trouble now, and I actually set a challenge to Felicity, my wife, and it was more a challenge to myself during the current lockdown period to not buy anything online. So we're getting to the stage where you're bored and just searching online. I was buying all sorts of random stuff, turning out some new socks. I'll get some bath salts. I'll get some, you know, I'm just absolutely ridiculous stuff, which I don't need turning up. Again. So if you look at cutting down that online spending right at this point in time to give people something positive to do right now and a test, try no online shopping for a month and see how much you save. You guys have been to Thailand? or like those yeah, sort of many, many times. Okay. You might have been to a country, Boz, uh, where they've got an airport tax to get out of the, get out of the airport. They've got one in Bangkok oh. Airport. Yeah. I was the uh, first overseas trip I ever did was with four mates. We went to Bangkok, and went to Thailand, Phuket. On the way home, we got to the airport, we're about to leave. And out of myself and the other four mates, I was the only one who had the money to actually pay to pay the airport tax. None of us were expecting it. It was like 500 baht, which I think works out to be $27 for the departure tax. So you left me money. They were absolutely skint. So I got money out to cover the other guys. But while we were on the way back, one of my housemates I was chatting to, I was like, I don't understand, mate. I thought you were doing all right. You've been working really hard. What's going on? He's like, oh, well, I stopped paying my phone bill four months ago so I could save up the money to, to actually go on this trip. He'd borrowed money from pretty much every one of us on the trip as well. 
it's like, I don't understand. And I worked out he was living well beyond his means. And when we got back to Brisbane, he hit me up for some money so we could go out on a, the next Saturday night. I said, like, no worries, I'll give you some money. He turned up at the bar 30 minutes later to buy four people drinks. And I was like, well, what's going on? I've just given you that money. Couldn't even stop himself from spending it. And I guess that was one of the things that was a big wake up call for me. And for like, had a good heart to heart with my mate after that and helped him to turn around some of his spending habits. But I, I just realized there's so many people who want to live beyond their means. Don't even think about tomorrow. It's all about how can I not miss out on what's going on today, what everybody else is up to. And uh, unfortunately for them, they hadn't seen the hard yards I'd put in years earlier to get to the point where I could pay departure tax for myself and my four mates. Well done. I think it, it really does come down to discipline what we're talking about, doesn't it? And there's so many different disciplines that you people put focus on one and then they drop another one. So if you have discipline across the board going, you need discipline on the amount of food you're putting in your mouth or your waistline is going to be impacted. You need discipline on the amount you're spending or you're not going to be able to afford the things that matter. I think um, we've got an online budget tool on the Open Court website people can work through. But my PA years ago was extremely OCD when it came to budgeting. She had 11 different bank accounts and each money, month when I handed her a pay, she'd put money into each one of those bank accounts. She controlled them and her husband never went near them. So in any couple... It does need to be someone who probably takes charge a little bit or has that discussion to prompt an agreement on how the money is going to be managed. I'm not saying one person should take control of it. Felicity and I are very even with what we do, but we have an agreement. And that's like I said before, I said to her, what do you reckon we do? No online spending for a month. See how that goes. I should say she's very frugal when it comes to money. She was driving a Kia for a number of years and I went out and bought her $180,000 Merc because I thought maybe she liked that. Not not without her knowing. It was a mutual agreement on a new car she was going to get. She drove around for six months and went, I think I prefer the Kia. So the badge, and there's another thing I want to talk about, the badge that people have sitting on their cars and their driveways at this point in time is a really good reflection to look outside your window when you're not using your car and think to yourself, how much do I really need that expensive car sitting in the driveway? I uh, actually went for uh, a morning off kettle fit, went for a walk for an hour. Early this morning, I was listening to um, Paddy Mills' podcast on the Howie Games. Yep. And Howie asked him about, you know, what the NBA lifestyle was like, how he adjusted to being around people with all the money and the glitz and the glamour, and actually asked him if you're happy to share, you know, what do you drive and so on. Paddy Mills starts laughing. He says, I've got a two-door Volkswagen Golf. And all of the guys take the piss, you know, out of me for it. And we said, oh, you're running the golf. Like, why, you know, why don't you have a Bentley or whatever? And he said, I just don't feel I need it. Gets me from where I am to the stadium or whatever I'm doing. Yeah. And, you know, this is a guy that's got no drama spending money. He's just, I think, 1.3 mil. Don't quote me on the number. About, it was over a million bucks. Yeah, yeah. He's donated to the social and community causes that he supports off his salary. Yeah. So he chooses to use his money to give back and invest in the community just like I guess people invested in him early days. Yeah, I remember um, speaking about NBA just because you remind me, I remember um, talking to Bogut, he's obviously one of our clients, and Andrew was saying when he was flying around with the Golden State Warriors in their um, private jets, obviously I went, seriously, you've got to explain to me what goes on in those private jets when they're flying around. He goes, yeah, it's like two different groups. He goes, I was an old sort of floated between both. He goes, you got all the young guys up the front who get all excited and, you know, they're jumping around the place. And he goes, you got the old boys up the front, you know, like Curry. And he goes, I'd, I'd go up there. Uh, he goes, you know, Draymond Green. we just sit around, you know, playing poker. He goes, um, but he goes, I couldn't stay up there too long because the amount they were betting was even beyond my means. And, you know, for a guy who went 100 plus million in his career, to say a poker hand's too expensive, I think it just came down. He's really good at managing money, but I think he was looking at it going, it's just ridiculous the amount of money you're betting between each other. But obviously they can afford it, you know, in a different league. Anyway, off track there. <laughs> it, it was a bit of an aside, but it, budgeting and effective money management is not something that's unique to one segment of the community. Everyone can learn something from it. Yeah. It's interesting what you say about online shopping, Cam, because on the webinar that was one of the things – that I told people about. Oh, really? Yeah. Give yourself, give yourself a challenge. Unsubscribe from all the mailing lists and brands that pepper you yeah. with uh, with this email advertising. Avoid the temptation and the impulse buying because clearly, you know, if you're in Melbourne, you've got less to do, so the temptation is only heightened. Yeah. Apply a want versus a need filter. Only buy kind of what you 
need as opposed to everything that you want. Yeah. The other big one that prompted me, I got our in home insurance policy renewal going back about three weeks ago, and the premium had gone up 7.8% from last year. There you go. So straight away, reviewing all of the expenses that you've got and shopping around for a better deal, people are leaving thousands on the table. So yeah. think about those common expenses that you've got. The easiest way to do it when you're doing a budgeting exercise Go back as a minimum for the last three months, ideally for the last six months. Yep. Categorize all of your spending. And when you come across a policy, just make a note of it, review it, and with five minutes of effort, chances are you can probably get a better deal. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good exercise for people to do because what we're talking about here is is freeing up money so your cash flow is better and you can hold more investment properties or save the next deposit for an investment property. That's really the core of what we want to achieve here. So if you're using a budget tool, for example, using the one from our website, once you've gone through those bank statements, which let's face it, people spend huge amounts of hours every week working for someone else or doing things that don't really matter spend a couple of hours once a month going through or once a quarter going through your own personal finances and sort yourself out. So go through those bank statements, group it into getting a realistic picture of where money's going. So how much money is going to online random shopping, how much is going to food, how much you've got Apple subscriptions, which for things you never use. You know, so break those things down and then I set the challenge and go, all right, in the, today's market, in today's interest rates, a property should cost you basically zero to hold. If you buy a new property, very rare it costs you anything out of your back pocket. Let's say it costs you 50 bucks. So in my, in, and that's you know, a few years ago, I remember when it used to cost about 50 bucks on the properties that we're buying. Well, how many $50 can I save every week by going through those expenses and bringing my overall expenses down? The other way to look at it is going, people I would suggest are probably wasting 20% of their wage minimally on crap they don't need. So if someone earns you know, 10 grand a month, for example, round, round numbers, Two grand a month, they're literally putting it in a metal rubbish bin and setting it on fire. So visualize that or put it to someone and go, physically go and get $2,000 out of your bank account and set it on fire. How does it make you feel? It's not a very good feeling, is it? Well, that's what people are doing, probably worse than that. So visual, I love a good visual, you know that, Boz. So especially for a podcast, it's uh, well and truly needed. <laughs> Yeah, 100%. And look, you know, as humans, we like habit and ease and convenience and the easier it is, the less we have to think about it. Financial management is something that requires a bit of effort, as you say. Yeah, yeah. Without doubt, one thing that I've been able to teach a few of my friends over the years is you're not actually saving 50 bucks a week. Yeah. If $50 a week is the extra amount of money you're putting in your pocket but that allows you to hold an asset that goes up by 500 grand there you go. Over, the course, over the course of you know 10 years, for example, then actually it's a lot more than that. Yeah, exactly. All right, I want to talk uh, market at the moment, mate. There's been, we're midway through, I'd love to say midway through, I just feel like it's midway through the, midway through the year, I've got Christmas in my head when Donald Trump guaranteed the world there'll be a vaccine by Christmas. So that's what I'm hanging my hat on. Because he's 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 never said a, he's never said an alternate fact, but uh, I'm, I'm looking at it going all right. So we're you know it's now kicking into September. We've been through lockdown one, lockdown two in Victoria, but the property market is not doing what it's supposed to do based on what the experts were telling us at the start of this whole thing, or the the economic experts, or the government experts, or every man and his dog expert. So. Talk through some of those numbers, mate. We've got CoreLogic data that's come out today. So CoreLogic, um, it's your good mate, Tim Lawless, who uh, you catch up with recently. Have you got some of the numbers in front of you? I've got them here if you want. I do, yeah. It was really interesting because the headlines that were clearly making their way across the country in the mainstream media, definitely the worst case scenario because they get the biggest bang for their buck. Yeah. But I believe the CBA – were talking about their range in terms of what they thought would would happen with house prices. Best case scenario was 3% down. Worst case scenario was 32% down. <laughs> you don't have to be buying Freddie to work out. That's a pretty big range. <laughs> so my five-year-old could probably get something in that range. So the whole purpose of what they were saying really was we don't know what the impact's going to be. It might be minor. It might be massive. As usual, with house prices, there are a whole range of different factors 
that go into it. And there was just so much uncertainty. Even the banks didn't really know what was going to happen. I was going to say they're, they're probably right because as we talk about, there's not one market. You could break, I could pick segments of the market where in the apartment market, yep, they smack 30% quite easily. And in the areas of the affordable housing market, they've seen increases. You bang on, you're exactly taking the lead on where I was going to go because- Sorry, the, mate, taking your glory. And yeah, we're not even in the same place. <laughs> we're on the same page. The, the main thing to remember that I find a lot of people aren't aware of is that the median house price is what is reported. For those of you out there that aren't aware, the median is the middle value in a data range. So if the median drops by say 5%, it doesn't mean every house has lost 5% of its value. It just means that the middle value has shifted backwards by 5%. Can we, so, can we be clear, clear on that, Mike? Because even when people understand that, I just want to really punch the point home that by the median shifting doesn't mean the value has dropped at all. It just means there's more sales around that area or less sales at potentially at the top end of the market. So the house at that price point hasn't shifted in value. It's just the median measure has moved. Yeah, you're exactly right. So if you think about what actually happens in an upturn is that because consumer confidence is up, inflation's probably up, wages are up, all of these things are up, then obviously there's going to be more demand and more comfort level in buying housing that pushes prices up. And what drives the median up is that it means there are more sales above the median than what there are below the median. Yeah. Now, there might still be a perfectly stable, strong, affordable housing market demand level, but if it's exceeded at the top end, then the median will go up. Flip side, during a downturn, why we see the medians coming backwards is because people are still buying houses at an affordable price point, even in a downturn. Yes, the volumes will be lower, but those transactions are still happening. Right. It takes a fair set of kahunas to be spending two million bucks in a COVID environment. If those transactions aren't happening, then the middle value is shifting backwards just based on where the, the distribution of sales are. I think that also what a lot of people don't really factor into that discussion around median as well. And obviously, as you said, demand in the inflationary environment where everybody's really confident might be higher at the upper end. But the most important factor is who's selling their houses. And when the market is buoyant, people with the really premium properties are putting them on the market, which means there's more expensive properties above the median going on the market. And when there's a little bit less confidence right now, there's a lot fewer properties going on the market. And certainly everybody who's in an expensive house that's their high income earners and they're comfortable with their wages, they're not selling right now. They're putting off their sale decisions to change or whether that's downsizers who are selling really expensive homes in Mosman or Camberwell, or whether it's just people who want to upgrade from one expensive suburb to the next highest suburb, they're not going to put their property on the market. So that's why we're also seeing more of the sales that are coming through in the lower bands as opposed to the full range of prices that we might normally see. But one last thing, one extra thing just on inflation. You guys probably saw late last week the Fed Reserve came out with an announcement, yeah. a fairly uh, seismic shift in their monetary policy. Just for listeners, Louis, do you want to give a two second on what the Fed Reserve is? Uh, so the Federal Reserve is America's central bank. Obviously, Australia has a central bank, Reserve Bank of Australia. They issue currency. They set the interest rate policy. And they've generally got a mandate, which is to try and achieve inflation of between 2 and 3%. So they're targeting full employment is one of their mandates, plus inflation between 2 to 3% per annum. For the last decade, the American economy has seen less than 2% inflation. In fact, it's been about 1.6%, which means that prices aren't growing fast, which some people might say, oh, that's good. There's price stability. But uh, obviously there's a reason why they want inflation. It's because it helps debts to disappear faster as well. For instance, when a government borrows a heap of money, like the American government did in the GFC, if prices go up, the economy is inflating faster and the debt to GDP is going down relative so so it's like a house. If you've got a fixed amount of debt and the house value goes up, your LVR is coming down. And that's exactly what's happening when the GDP of an economy is growing, but their government debt, if it can stay stable, is getting smaller relative to the GDP. But the big thing was that the Federal Reserve came out and said, 
you know what, we've undershot our 2 to 3% price band for the last decade. So we're actually happy if we can achieve over the next 10 years that for 20 years we've averaged 2 to 3%, which means for the next 10 years we're happy to see 3 to 4% inflation. And that's really hard to do without overcooking it. And what's likely to happen, and markets have responded really quickly, what's likely to happen is that asset values are going to go up relatively quick for the next decade because they're going to keep interest rates low. What yeah. Post GFC, obviously they put the money into the economy to stimulate the economy. They started taking it out about five years ago to just keep the, I guess, take their foot off the accelerator a little bit. This time they're saying, no, we're going to keep our foot down. And it's such a big economy with so much money. We're talking trillions of dollars that don't just live in America. US dollars are not finding the, their way around the world, including into the Australian economy. And that means that there's more money in just about every economy in, in the world as a result of that decision. And that's going to be pushing asset values up here as well for the next decade. So I think it's a really good point you made just so people understand the debt and the concept of debt within the Australian government because that's what the headlines are throwing out at the moment, that the debt's the worst we've ever had in the history of the world and, you know, the debt's going to crumble the economy and we're going to throw away the dollar and we're going to start, you know, trading hours worked for, you know, food and you know, the, the old economy as we knew it's gone. The reality is of the debt, and Matt made a good point, which I just want to drill home, the concept of GDP to the asset of the economy. So the amount of debt to GDP is very similar to an LVR to a house. So most investors don't pay off, and to reduce your loan-to-value ratio, you don't pay off the loan. The asset grows in value. And that's exactly the same way as the government planned to do it, and what we did after the Second World War is instead of paying down the debt, we grow the asset value, so we grow the economy. Yeah, well, there's two parts of it, isn't it? Because if, again, just using that similarity to a house, if the house value is going up and the rent that you're generating from that house value goes up, sure. then not only is the loan-to-value ratio coming down, but you're also generating more surplus cash that you can use to pay off the debt faster. So with the economy, if the GDP goes up or well, the size of the economy grows the amount of tax that the government can take out of the economy is going up. That's their income, which means that it's a lot easier for them to pay down debt if they wanted to. And like you said, post-World War II, debt to GDP was 120%. They went on a big growth spurt where the, obviously we saw some high inflation for the next 20 years, but also we saw really high immigration. Obviously, if we're increasing the number of people in the economy, that helps to speed up the rate that the economy grows as well. And so debt went from 120% of GDP in the late 40s, within a decade, be down to about 40% of GDP. And at the same time, for 30 years, they kept unemployment at 2%, despite like our country's highest rate of immigration on record. So, yeah, I think it's something, again, a lot of people aren't sort of perhaps students of history to the extent that we are looking at the economy and housing markets and all these, I guess, the interactions between immigration and, but yeah, it tells a pretty compelling story about what we can expect over the next few years. Especially to get the economy cranking, I think there's the five big sectors which the government are going to put focus on. You've got building, infrastructure, tourism, health, and education are the ones that we talk about. So obviously the number one out of those is the building industry because it has that compounding effect of if the government puts an incentive in place, they actually get more back through charges and taxes than they put into a, a stimulus package. But you've also got the power of leverage. So I think when the government wants to turn the economy on, which as we've talked about, when ScoMo talked about building a bridge and getting over this, the term we've been used is putting the economy on idle. And you just keep ticking along until you get to the point where COVID's out of the way and you need to crank the economy up and get it going to the point where it's self-sustaining. So the stimulus packages they'll put in, we predict, will be into those five key sectors and the number one of those being into the building industry, which obviously then gets prices going very fast. Yeah, it's really interesting because you mentioned Tim Lawless before and I'll get to the data in a sec, Cam, but going back to late March, I actually interviewed Andrew Wilson as well. For those of you that have probably recognised Andrew's name, he is the ex chief economist for the Domain Group uh, here in Australia. So uh, fairly reputable source. Uh, Channel 9 rang him three times in the hour and a half I was interviewing him for them him to appear on you know, their, their nightly news because there was all the uncertainty around COVID. Long story short, there are a few key things that Andrew and I talked about. And we talked about 
the fact that sales volume would drop to a point where demand met it. So we would see, in our opinion, relatively even median house prices. And again, the August data that's just come out suggests the same national dwellings down less than half a percent. You know, worst case, about 1.2% in Melbourne, which is understandable based on where we're at right now. Definitely not these dramatic crashes that we expected. We also talked about the fact that long-term fundamentals underlie the market and that Australia was in a really strong position pre-COVID. And as a result, you know, we're seeing that 3.5% in Brisbane, nearly 6% in Melbourne, nearly 10% in Sydney are the amounts that prices are still above where they were this time 12 months ago. So not that we have a crystal ball, but all these things we're talking about with regards to the indicators in the economy and what we've seen through previous downturns and what we've written in the upcoming book, you might want to tell people about it. We've seen this recipe. There are core things that influence the economy, and that's what's really important to, uh, to focus on. The, yeah, I was going to ask you, Matt, just to elaborate, because I know you run the acquisition team and you've got a whole team on the ground in each capital city working, understanding this land supply, what developers have got coming onto the market, what pressure. And I think um, while we haven't got a crystal ball, there is a definitely a more murky ball that you can look into to try and get a grasp of the future. And I think some of those drivers that we focus on, which that's what I want to get you to elaborate on, Matt, if you wouldn't mind, what's going on and the you know, boots on the ground, what's happening out there in the markets? Yeah, it's funny. You don't need a crystal ball, I guess, when you to know which direction the wind's blowing when you're standing in it. And uh, it becomes pretty obvious. But yeah, I mean, already we're seeing in a couple of states, vacancy rates lower than they were in fact in five out of the eight capital cities around Australia vacancy rates are lower today than they were at the start of the year so obviously the media is not picking up on that media is talking about how obviously there's a lot of glut of properties came onto the market at the start of COVID and absolutely around CBDs it did a lot of the Airbnbs that people put onto the permanent rental pool and are slowly taking them off now that borders in some states are opening that's kind of reversing that trend. But in other states, the trend has been pretty consistent. There was a bit of a blip in March and since then it's dropped back down. So we're seeing low vacancy rates. That doesn't tell us that prices are going to go up, but that does tell us that there's a shortage of properties right now. We're also seeing in land markets in a couple of states at the moment, since in fact, it was something we saw before Home Builder was announced, we started to see people coming back into the market. And it's like a rubber band effect. If you take people off the market for six months and Melbourne's pretty much been since March and we're in September now. So six months of people not buying property, that's a lot of pent up demand. People who still want to move, people who have perhaps been renting longer than they initially intended to or staying at home with their mum and dad who need to move out. That's going to be a lot of people coming onto the market once this lockdown ends. And we saw it in Brisbane, we've seen it in Perth. Once that happens, like the elastic band, things just boom for a month or two as all that pent-up demand catches up. And once that's happened, confidence has lifted all of a sudden. And maybe, and obviously beyond that, demand return and supply returns to more normalised levels, but the confidence is there. And we're seeing in some markets that properties aren't like this. They're going a lot quicker today than they were like in February before COVID hit. And that's just because people kind of feel, geez, we're through this. We've seen the worst of what the economy and life has to throw at us perhaps. And we're all still here. We're still earning money and jobs are back. It's only going to be up from here. And uh, yeah, that that's something that's a little bit intangible, but when you see it in the markets that we deal in, it's it's quite obvious what's going on. Hey guys, um, obviously we've had some surprising data. And like you said, in some areas, specifically in Brisbane, some areas we've had a 400% increase in land sales in June alone. And that uh, that is a huge amount of stock to be taken from the market, which puts additional pressure. Vacancy rates are near zero in some of those areas, which is just astounding compared to what's going on out in the marketplace. So like you said, that like a band is getting pretty stretched, which is a good thing as for an investor. I want to probably, uh, unless we've got anything else I want to um, nail off, I might wrap it up today, guys. But what I wanted to talk about and post to you for next time, for next week if we can, is I want to talk about investing in the new normal. So what I'd like to do to be able to give people clarity about where we are at the moment, we've talked about some of those levers today. But what I'd really like to hone in on, if we pick out a few of the major events that have happened over the last 35 years, even going back, um, well, some of the ones that we talk about, the uh, removal and reinstatement of negative gearing, the 90s recession, 
We can go talk about the Asian financial crisis. Uh, I want to go through things like September 11, uh, the GFC in particular, and look at what things drove those economies and how property markets and even share markets responded post those. So we can have a look at the similarities between those points in time and what we're going through at the moment to allow people to have an understanding of what's going to happen to the back end. So I want to turn uncertainty into certainty for investors. How's that sound? Sounds great. All good, guys. Thank you very much for your time today. Good to talk to you. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and may not be relevant to your personal situation. You should seek advice from a licensed professional before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned, and opinions and views expressed may not reflect those of the Smart Property Investment Network.